All right, everyone, welcome to our 11 o'clock press conference. This is five years after Deepwater Horizon, oh, sorry, marshes in coastal Louisiana, five years after Deepwater Horizon. Our speakers today will be Ed Overton from the LSU Department of Environmental Sciences, Linda Hooper, boy, 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 from, also from the LSU Department of Environmental Sciences, and Paula Lopez Duarte from Rutgers University. Well, good morning and thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'd like to give you our perspective on uh, what's happened since this horrible disaster that occurred uh, five years ago in 2010. Uh, we we're all part of uh, one of the uh, consortia that was funded by the money that uh, BP put aside, the uh, so-called Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. So I'm the chemist in that group, and then we've got a variety of other scientists, two of my colleagues in the Coastal Water Consortium are here to discuss their work. So I'm going to give you my perspective of what's happening uh, with an oil spill from a chemical perspective, and they'll kind of fill in the details of how it helps uh, the critters and the insects and the other components of our ecosystem. So first slide just uh, talks about, uh, you know, how, do, how does oil hurt? A pollutant is, is, is a substance that's added to the environment that uh, overrides the environment's capacity to handle it, right? And of course, with a, a spill of 200 million gallons or so, you've clearly overridden the environment's capacity to handle uh, that pollutant. And that pollutant, is, is, as we know, is oil. But what does oil do? Well, it, it's got some of the chemicals in oil are known to be toxic to living animals, right? So we've got the toxicity component. But it also does other things besides uh, a toxic effect. It smothers and coats. And of course, in this slide, we can see two examples of smothering and coating, of coating and affecting the ability of that animal's feathers to function and regulate its body temperature and the coating of the coastal marsh grasses. And you, you think a grass is just a grass, but that, that grass is performing a vital function. It's passing gases in and out, it's absorbing light. And when you coat those grasses, uh, it destroys that, the function of that, uh, that part of the ecosystem and that, that component will die. Uh, and then also, almost everything in oil, almost all of the hundreds of thousands of compounds in oil will be degraded by natural organisms, and that will use up a lot of the available oxygen. That's particularly critical in coastal marshes, up in the marshes, because generally you don't have a lot of extra oxygen there. It's, it's, it's right on the edge between having enough oxygen, we call that oxic, and then not having enough anoxic. Uh, and so if you use up all of that oxygen, clearly you're gonna, gonna have a major impact. Uh, also, since all of those compounds in oil are being degraded, they're changing the food supply, and so we call that carbon enrichment. So particularly in the offshore areas, that's, we've seen some significant uh, impacts from this mucus, flocky looking material that's settled out to the bottom. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, oil spills affect the ecological components, and we're gonna be talking mostly about that. Uh, but we also, because we're in a very fragile area and when coastal plants are, di are killed by an oil spill, we, those plants hold in the, the sediment and so you have coastal erosion. So most oil spills don't affect the uh, uh, geology, but in, in Louisiana, that's not the case. Then it was a massive economic impact. Of course, the summer is a, is a critical economic time along the Gulf Coast, and this spill occurred and affected. Effectively, we didn't have a decent summer season, a, a lot of economic impacts, and then people live in this area, of course, uh, and these are the social. First of all, the, the march of the coast, as you saw in the last press conference, if you were here, is a, is a press con is a, is a coast under extreme stress. So this, this happened off the coast of Louisiana, and we're talking about a very stressed ecosystem. Uh, my colleague Linda is gonna talk about what a coastal marsh does for us in terms of economic and, and uh, ecological value. But if you look at this thing, none of, none of these structures are natural. That doesn't look like, in fact, it's hard to find maybe over in here what a natural marsh would look like. I mean, this particular picture just doesn't have it. So, so uh, and all of these, I might add, are tightly affected, right? In, in other words, oil offshore had the potential to come in and coat the marsh in here. Fortunately, that didn't happen to a large extent, but when, we, when the spills started, we were really worried about uh, what could happen. So in 2010, you know, massive amounts of oil did come ashore. Remember the spill occurred 50 miles off the, the mouth of the Mississippi River, 100 miles from the, the uh, Alabama-Florida coastline. 
and uh, there was some question about whether the oil would come ashore. Well, uh, that was answered relatively quickly within the short time of the of uh, in, in, in May, the spill lasted for 87 days with spewing oil into the Gulf, and some of it got up into northern Barrateria Bay. The currents and the tides and the winds and the circulation of the water currents to the west of the Mississippi River literally sucked oil up into Barrateria Bay area, and this is kind of what it looked like. So uh, massive amounts of oil, mostly as what's called an oil and water emulsion, right? So this is not fresh oil. This is not the material that came out of the the well, this is a mixture of oil and water, kind of a mayonnaise -y, gunky looking material, had a, a reddish color, came ashore along the coastal in percent levels, right? A coastline, when you got water floating out in the, uh, in the open water, it patches together. So you got a glob of oil here, and, and I remember flying out over the spill, and you could fly for 45 minutes or so, not see anything, and then all of a sudden there was oil everywhere. Well, along the coastline, that's the barrier between the open water. What happens is that it concentrates oil. So you have massive amounts of oil slapped onto the coastline uh, back about, uh, you know, 10 to 20 to 30 meters. So that's where most of this oil, and it was in percent levels compared to what you saw generally when you're looking at offshore. This, this next slide just is, uh, I, I threw it in because we had the Gomery Conference down in Tampa a couple of weeks ago, and these are, this is some nerder data from some of my colleagues. But these are all of the samples that were collected of seawater, right? They just, they just said, this is the number, number one sample out to the number 10,000, right? And these are the concentrations. Here's the part per trillion line, part per billion, part per million. And remember I said in coastal Louisiana and on the marsh, we're talking about percent. So there's massive amounts of oil having a big impact as opposed to being diluted by massive amounts of water. So it's this focusing that really had us worried. We had to get big oil spill, uncontrolled, we didn't know how long it was gonna last, and we know that, that the marsh environment is the most ecologically sensitive relative to, uh, to coastal beaches. So, uh, so let's, let's, let's start moving ahead, 2010, Bloody mess, it was a bloody mess offshore, it was a bloody mess onshore. Uh, not all of our coastal marshes, something like 10,000 uh, 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 tidally affected marsh uh, land, uh, lines 10,000 miles in Louisiana, only about 1,000 of that, so roughly 10% in Louisiana was actually impacted. So that's a lot better than, than we initially were worried about. But what happens, this is a year later, fairly remarkable, uh, we flew over, and, and see that, they call, I call it the ring of green. This is where marsh plants had died and, and the, the spring uh, planting is starting to grow. Now, you might say, why is it different back here? Well, that, that, those, those grasses, those, those coastal grasses just weren't uh, killed by the oil. Remember, the oil was a, a collar of oil mostly focused in, in large percent quantities right along the coastline. But that was really good news to see, wait, this is in March. Oh, look, I thought all that was gonna be dead and we would see just oil everywhere. Uh, you can see it again here, the, the, the plants, this is uh, the later on in the summer where they're starting to regrow and if you look right up here, that's this back area. Now, unfortunately, there were plenty of areas, you know, that still had massive amounts of oil and that the plants didn't regrow. So you, you have a lot of coast and if there were pockets in the coast where the plants were killed, and those, those, of course, are what accelerated coastal erosion. So w w what happened in, in the, in the, along the coast is that the moose came ashore. We had the residue on the surface. Its oil can get associated with the fine particles. So one of the big issues is, do these fine particles, the, the silt and the mud that comes down the Mississippi River, do they help or hurt? General consensus is that, they are, that that is a cleaning mechanism and that's helping. And that's part of these ongoing studies of the Coastal Water Consortium. So we had oil on the surface and, and what we're recently finding now that, that a lot of, some of that oil in areas that were impacted, in areas that were impacted, is now in the subsurface. And if you look down that hole, this is a plug that came out of that hole. And see that little blister there? That's what that blister looks like. That's actual oil and this was collected in November, right? So we've still got, even though uh, uh, in most surface samples we can find, hardly find oil now, we've really, really improved. There is significant oil that has been buried probably in crab burrows that were down there and some, some of that oil got way below the surface. So in small areas around there, we are seeing 
uh, uh, significant amounts of oil, fairly fresh oil, still in the surface five years. That was a, a, a significant surprise. Uh, I do want to emphasize that when we say these are impacted areas, these are not all of the coast. These are relatively small areas along that coastal stretch that had heavy oiling that's still in. The vast majority of the land along the coast have been significantly uh, uh, improved, but you can go out and dig. Now, you've you got to be careful to dig in a hole because you're you are destroying the structure of the marsh. So when we go out and collect these samples, we collect them, we dig down, we collect oil samples, and we put that plug back in so that we haven't potted the, the coastal marshes uh, and caused more damage trying to study the marsh than it, than it would if we left it alone. So I'd like to, uh, to close by just saying that, you know, all surface in the most sediments is almost to background levels. Again, we, we analyze hundreds of samples a year for my colleagues. In almost all of those samples, the, the level of a detectable oil is virtually at background level. In other words, it's hard to tell the difference between impacted areas and non-impacted areas. Uh, some moderately weathered oil remains, and again, down in these uh, crab burrows, uh, pH content in the marsh content has changed from uh, those that are the pHs of the, the toxic compounds from, from the, uh, the, the composition associated with oil to right now, almost all of the composition is associated with forest fires in particular, uh, uh, we call it petrogenic, uh, I mean pyrogenic uh, fallout from these things. So it's, it's surface, surface really looks good. It's, it's, a, it's a tale of, of how our environment can recover if we let it do it, right? So what we had in the summer of 2010 was a bloody mess. And now we're, we're having trouble on the surface finding oil. We're having to look harder and harder uh, down into these bores. Uh, we are also looking at how this oil is degrading and changing. And you might say, hey, that's good. It's degrading and changing. Under the laws in the United States, the responsible party is responsible for cleaning up the oil. Uh, and how do we know that, uh, that this oil came from the deep water horizon? And we have a method called uh, forensic fingerprinting where we look at uh, patterns of chemicals in the oil. Well, that pattern is changing. The environment is changing it. So deep water horizon oil looks different now than it looked in 2010, and we're trying to follow that. But normally that change would say this is not deep water horizon oil. So this is important for future oil spills, and that's one of the, one of the outcomes I think we're going to have from this consortium. Uh, these are just the patterns, and the patterns are for chemists, and, uh, you know, it'll put you to sleep. But suffice it to say that uh, uh, we are, we are, the impacts from the oil spills seem to be very much diminished, certainly dramatically diminished. It is a testament to how our environment can recover. I think that to me, to me, that was one of the most wonderful things when I flew over in March to just see the grass recovering in areas that were just bloody well coated with oil. And five years later, we're, tr we're having, as, as my colleagues will explain, difficulty finding significant impacts. A testament to if, if we let Mother Nature handle it, she will recover. That doesn't mean that we should have, uh, allow oil spills, but oil spills are components that can be degraded naturally in oil, and so we want to do everything we can to help Mother Nature heal herself. So let me let uh, Linda talk about some of the impacts on uh, insects in coastal marshes. Let's see. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Linda Hooper Bowie. And before I get started and talk to you about insects, I'm going to talk to you about like, well, why why do you know why did I come into the marsh and why did I start studying insects? And um, so insects are minutia. So I'm going to take you uh, first and talk to you about fish um, because fish are delicious and we love fish. Um, so Gulf, the Gulf Coast, um, where this you know as Ed called it, a horrible oil spill happened. Uh, is responsible for a large portion of the nation's seafood and 70% uh, of the nation's oysters and 69% of the domestic shrimp and millions of pounds of hard and soft shell crabs. And so, 
and of course billions of pounds of shellfish and finfish. And it turns out that, okay, so that is offshore and inshore, but it turns out the marsh is a very important nursery for most of those fish. And um, a lot of those landings, the menhaden and the shrimp and the things that, are, that come out of our Gulf of Mexico, they, they spend a good portion of their life, um, especially their young life, in the marsh. And so it's really, really important that the marsh is there. And so as you heard the, my colleagues earlier talk about land loss, that first of all, the marsh needs to be there. But also, when we um, study the health of the marsh, which is why I'm out there, the, it's really important for the, our nation's seafood um, for it to be there. And also, that's just the food. The ecosystem services for storm protection and other things are also important, the attenuation of waves and, and other things. Um, and so um, I just wanted to reiterate, you know, that we had over um, $500 million in just uh, the landings of Manhattan and shrimp in 2011, which is, you know, the year after the oil spill um, in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And so in Louisiana, particularly our marshes are really important because over 75% of the seafood is dependent um, as a nursery ground for the uh, marshes. And so even though we don't tend to not see a lot of that happening um, in the marshes, we, it, they are very important. So, um, I don't study fish, though. Um, well, I do study fish, but I don't spend my life studying fish. Um, so, I've told you that the Gulf of Mexico is a nursery ground for fish. Um, it's also a flyaway for the, the world's uh, portion, a portion of the world's migratory birds. And um, so it's the ecosystem that's really important. And the portion of the ecosystem that I'm particularly focused on is the insects. And insects are kind of the center of the food web. Um, and Paula's gonna talk to you a little bit about more about that food web. She's gonna talk about fish. Um, so I'm gonna stop talking about fish and I'm gonna start talking about insects. And they're food for um, the birds and the fish. Um, so how do fish feed on insects? They uh, fish live in water, and most of the time insects are out of the water. Well, fish come up to plants, and they nudge plants with their, the fronts of their body. I don't know, are they noses, Paula? Um, they nudge the plants, and they knock the insects off the plants, and any insect that falls in the water uh, is their food. Um, fish jump out of the water and feed on uh, insects that might be flying. Um, you've seen that some of that behavior. So that's um, one of the the, the ways that insects feed fit in that. The insects also live in the mud in the marsh grasses. Um, so I'm gonna give you a couple take home messages. Um, the insects, as you've probably heard reported, I reported, um, were decimated in 2010 um, after the oil spill. And we expected to measure recovery in 2011, and in fact, we saw that they didn't recover. In fact, the situation was worse in 2011. And um, the ants, which are my favorite, um, the population of the ants crashed um, in 2011. Uh, and they're the ones that are feeding on lots and lots of different kinds of insects in the marsh. Um, in 2012, I'm going to show you some pictures. Hurricane Isaac came through. Um, so not only do we have an oil spill, we had hurricanes and storm surge. And Hurricane Isaac came through, and I'm going to show you some pictures of what Hurricane Isaac did with the, um, with the PAHs, the oil residue. Um, and so I'm going to show you some pictures of what happened with that. So Hurricane Isaac moved oil residue is the best way uh, I can term it. So I'm going to show you some photos of that. But, um, and so the, the story has been for years, you've heard me say for the last five years, uh, if you've been paying attention to anything I've said, is that the insects were decimated in 2010, we expected to see recovery in 2011, and we expected to see recovery in 2012, but Hurricane Isaac came through and decimated everything, including on our unoiled areas. And so we've been measuring, expecting to measure recovery, 
And in finally in 2015, we finally saw recovery across the ecosystem, which is really, uh, was insanely exciting for me, finally. Um, so my patience paid off. And so the ants are a big indicator, and they've shown 73% recovery. We can measure this pretty accurately. The ants are very organized, and they have a certain way of organizing themselves in the ecosystem, and they organize themselves in one way. Um, and they've organized themselves in exactly the same way um, as they did before the oil spill and before the hurricane and now after the hurricane. And so the population structure is literally uh, in as exact as I can say in scientific terms, exactly the same. So that's the main points of what I'm gonna show you. Um, so Ed showed you some pictures um, and I, I particularly wanted to show you this picture because Bella is going to show you a similar picture of this site um, in her last, I believe her last slide. Um, so kind of burn this into your memory. Um, as this is uh, in 2011, this is a site that was heavily impacted um, by the oil spill. Um, so this is recovering, okay? So with these are, um, that's an area where, you know, the plants were denuded and there's some, peak, you know, residue, oil residue on the, soil, but it's, um, and so this is just happens to be a picture of what the marsh looked like in one of our field sites, and I wanted to show you just, um, because Paolo's going to show you, uh, Paolo's going to show you something. So, um, in uh, 2012, though, Isaac came along, and this is what we saw. So, I have a reputation for spending a lot of time in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I was... I look back in my field book and I was in the Gulf of Mexico the day before Isaac hit. I don't really understand what I was doing there when a hurricane was coming. Um, and then I w was there uh, as soon as I could get back in there legally um, with some controlling to the police officers and things. Um, and so we collected the, this here. And um, Ed, my friend here, my chemist, tested it and found that it matched the patterns that he discussed earlier. And, and um, because remember, after Hurricane Isaac, um, there were around 90 uh, platforms or wells that were leaking. Um, so we couldn't immediately blame what appears to be residue, oil residue, on these plants. Um, on the oil spill, um, but Ed was able to fingerprint this and show that this was um, from the BP oil spill. And so we, what we were able to do was show that Hurricane Isaac mobilized oil. Now, we don't know where this came from. It could have been offshore, it could have been within the marsh, but this oil residue looks very fresh, it smells very fresh, and its impact is devastating to insects, um, I can tell you that. Um, and so we know that the hurricanes and storm surge is, is, is a big issue when it comes to uh, oil spills. So that causes monkey wrenches in, in scientific research. Also what causes monkey wrenches is this degradation pattern that he brought up, the pattern A and pattern B. Um, what I will tell you from our research, another take home message is we know pattern A is toxic to insects. Um, we're still, uh, hopefully by Friday, my analysis will be done. Um, we'll tell you for sure whether to uh, pattern B is uh, toxic to beetles and flies and things like that. But I don't know if I'll have that done by then. But what we do know is in 2015 is we had about 15, uh, before Hurricane Isaac and before the oil spill is the ants we could find 1,500 colonies per acre. There's lots and lots of colonies out there. They live inside the marsh grass, and they eat all kinds of insects, and they eat bird scat, and they eat lots of dead things. Um, and they're, they're really great indicators of what's going on in the health that's in the marsh. And in late 2015, we were able, across the ecosystem, uh, previously oiled, previously unoiled, sites, we were able to find around 11,000, 1,100, excuse me, 
um, 1,100 colonies per hectare, which is very, uh, translates into roughly 73% recovery. Um, and across our, our data, the beetles and the spiders and the um, other insects are, appear to be, the populations appear to rebuilding themselves. Uh, the interesting thing is the ants are very predictable, so they're assembling themselves in the same pattern. And um, that's, oh, that's what I have to say. I'm done. And I'm going to pass it to Paula, who's going to talk about more about uh, the fish. Come on. Oh, sorry. I'll get out of your way. I thought you had an inserted slide. Slide show. And then you just press the down button. Thank you. I'm Paola Lopez Duarte from Rutgers University. And I am going to bring in more players to the discussion and talk about the recent work that we've been doing with marsh food webs. And I will focus on, on three points. First, the similarities between food webs in marshes that were originally impacted by oil in 2010 and those that were not hit by the oil. Second, the surprising aspects of these similarities given previous studies and some of those things that um, both um, Ed and Linda have mentioned. And third, the implications of our results relative to ongoing and future oil spill research. I wanted to point out that um, the picture that Linda just showed is um, a picture of the same site five years earlier. And there is no, um, that front area of the marsh, the marsh edge, is not, is not the same as it was five years ago. So we have, we have seen growth in, um, of the, the Spartina, the uh, marsh plants here in the front. This is a simplified food web. And based on studies um, that have looked at feeding observations and stomach contents, we can we have a pretty good idea of how to draw these vectors from prey to predator. But to understand, to really assess the impact of oiling, we want to provide some weight to those vectors. In other words, are these top predator fish feeding mostly, are there, is there energy coming mostly from other smaller fish? Or is their diet um, greatly composed of crustaceans, such as blue crabs? Well, to do that, we employ a series of chemical markers. The differences in energy sources, either from marsh plants or aquatic um, plankton, and the trophic level of these different species going from primary producers primary consumers, and all the way up to secondary and tertiary consumers can be defined by looking at the stable isotopes of the tissues in these species. We also employ other dietary markers, such as fatty acids, that help us characterize the diets of these different fish. Based on the chemical tracer work that we have completed, um, and that we started doing in 2015, we know that the marshes that were originally impacted by oil in 2010 have similar energy sources and trophic levels as the marshes that were not impacted by oil in 2010. And this is a very surprising finding because when we look at the last five years of research since the, um, the oil spill, we see that there are, there are great variation in the impact and the, and the responses of these different species. And in some groups, we see great population declines, as was the case for fiddler crabs. We also could see different rates of recovery. And in some of these, um, we even see no changes, and in some cases, the fish species actually exhibited a positive response following the oil spill. 
the idea or our expectation was that because of the decline in these different populations of different groups, that would translate into trophic cascades into the food web, and we would be able to see that in the food web. But we did it. So we cannot conclusively say that it never happened. We can just say that in 2015, marshes that were impacted by oil and marshes that were not impacted by oil in 2010 appear to be very similar. Another consideration that we have to take into account when we look at food webs is the discrepancy between population level responses and organismal level responses. The positive responses of fish and this has been documented in multiple studies for over 100 species, show that there was either no change or an increase in the population. And that is at odds with the very well-documented negative impacts in the physiology of fish. So when we have individual organisms, either in the lab and in the field, and we expose them to oil, there are very serious negative impacts on those animals. And they range from um, genomic effects to physiological effects, uh, their cost to their development, their reproduction, their growth, and their, even their survival. So there's a very big disconnect between those two responses. And one of the things that we have to do as, as people who are, who are interested in food webs is try to figure out why there is the disconnect. And there's at least two possible reasons why there is a disconnect. And the first has to do with the fish behaviors. This is work that Charlie Martin at LSU is leading, and his research suggests that fish can not only detect oil, but they can also avoid it. So for those fish, who were, um, or that were exposed to oil or were perceptive of this oil, if they were, if they were able to get away from these areas, they, they possibly did. The other factor that we have to consider are in, in, in one that occurred in, uh, um, in conjunction to this oil spill was a very widespread um, fishery closure. And Giovanna McClanachan, who's a, a PhD student at LSU with her advisor, Jean Turner, she's working on looking at the effects of the oil spill on the commercial fishery in Louisiana. We know that following the spill, the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries closed several areas for fishing for over six months. This was not only exclusive to fin fish, but also included crabbing, shrimping, and the harvest um, of oysters. The federal fisheries were also widespread, and initially they only encompass, encompassed the coast of Louisiana, but they were eventually extended to encompass four different states. So the lessons that we learn from this research is that oil, Oil is only one factor to consider when we're looking at the effects of the 2010 oil spill. Other factors, some of which you have heard of today, include the fisheries closures, high levels of land loss, storms, and um, and freshwater diversions, thank you. So with these in mind, with these factors in mind, we continue to study food webs and we continue to learn about the ecology of this highly stressed environment that was further stressed in 2010. The last thing I want to say is that um, there are several members of our consortium that are here this week. They have presentations and posters. Um, I am showing mine today at four. It's number 166. If you want to see some of these data and talk about more and talk about this research further, I, please stop by. I'll be at my poster this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions from reporters in the room? 
Hey, I'm Emily Yaley from Greenwire. Um, so what I'm getting from this is a lot of good news. If maybe you guys could put it in perspective um, of, and I know that that's a lot, that there's been a lot of studies of um, how the environment is doing after the oil spill, but is it as good as it sounds today? <laughs> Well, I, you know, in, in, there's been a lot of 2015 reports five years after the oil spill, and almost all of them talk about uh, diminished impact. You know, we, oil spills are acute events. Almost all of the damage occurs when it happens. It's like being in a wreck. You know, the damage is when the two, two cars hit together, and, and the rest of it is, is more or less recovery. That's a fairly general statement, but, but relatively accurate. So what we're doing is looking at what I think is underreported is the fact that the environment has recovered from such a massive insult. I mean, in five years, I think most of us are fairly surprised uh, that, that it has recovered to the extent it, it has. I, I know in our, uh, in our scientific uh, discussions within the Coastal Water Consortium, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, looking at other stressors now rather than oil spill stressors. And, and the reason is, you know, we're not seeing the oil spill in 2015. So this is, this is really good news, and it's a statement of, uh, as a chemist, the property of oil. Oil is a, a natural material. It, it, the Gulf of Mexico has something on the order of 50 million gallons a year naturally seep into the Gulf of Mexico every year, and it have been for the hundreds of thousands of years. It's seeping in, it's seeping in at a level that it can, can be handled by the natural environment. In fact, it provides a valuable food source for lots of organisms that are out there that the oil gets degraded into bacteria, the bacteria get eaten, and, and so on and so forth. Well, we had an overload of that system in 2010. The oil that came ashore was, was concentrated. Uh, uh, fortunately, it wasn't spread evenly. Uh, Hurricane Isaac did spread it, but, but spreading also dilutes it. So there's, there's, there's good news and bad news about the, uh, the storm impacts. But, but it's, it's encouraging, at least from my perspective, in 2015 to hear recovery of insects. You know, every, all other oil spills are focused on what's happening in the water. And here we've had a chance to see, you know, these, this, this horrible event not only affected critters that are in the water uh, from, from single cell organisms up to, uh, to fin fish, but also the insects that are in the coastal environment. Even the bird, uh, bird uh, populations were, were impacted during the first wave, and all of those are recovering. What Paula talked about is, is it's very difficult to see differences now in these coastal areas uh, impacted and pre-impacted. That's not bad news. That's tremendously good news, and it reflects the nature of the, the type of pollutant, and that is that oil is, is a reduced form of carbon, and, and it gets degraded into an oxidized form of carbon, turns back into CO2, becomes part of the carbon cycle again. So at least that's my take. Yeah, I think I'd like to address it in similar ways. I think Ed's point about it being, you know, first people think about it as an acute impact. And I think when I started to look at it, first of all, I never set out in my career to ever study an oil spill, um, even though I'm an ecologist and my background is in environmental toxicology, though. Um, so, you know, and I always tell people I'm trying to get away from my dependence on oil in terms of funding, right? So, but, so the idea, though, is we, we're, we go in and we try to just look at what is, what is happening. And, and so what I'm measuring now are chronic effects. So we initially it was an acute impact. Um, and now what we're seeing is chronic impacts. Um, now the question though is how do, how do we separate the impact of the oil versus the impact of storm surge on because and that's where I'm sorting out things. First of all, I have a huge number of different species, some of which have never been identified in the coastal ecosystem. Um, so that's science's issue. The second issue is we have a chronic impact issue, but you also have a highly disturbed system with lots of stressors. And you don't want a to ascribe a blame for to the oil that's actually storm surge or, you know, 
wind damage or you know from a hurricane for fresh example water. or freshwater diversion so we're actually so we measure you know we're measuring salinity we're you know and actually right before this Pal and I were talking about you know salinity gradients as you know uh, you know in these diversions of stressors um, so we are really trying to be very careful I am being super careful about what I'm saying, but I'm not, I don't have to be careful about telling you that I'm seeing recovery. Um, and it's, I was very cautious at the end of 2015, uh, 2014 when I saw the 30% recovery in the ants. I was like putting recovery in question marks, like am I seeing recovery? And I'll tell you with, when we go through another season. But I thought we were seeing recovery. And now that I went through 2015, we hit, you know, we had all the, the warmth and the you know water being off the marsh and we didn't have a hurricane and we didn't have a bunch of storm surge and things you know the stressors that we could and so I'm I'm very confident in telling you um, that the numbers that I'm ascribing to the recovery are solid um, and that nature is resilient and that's that's the exciting message is nature is very resilient even though they it, an acute stressor and then these chronic stressors over five years from that acute incident and that the insects are very resilient and the other message is that they're pretty good and in, in inexpensive indicators of stress yeah remember in the, the exxon valdez oil spill about four or five years after the spill there was a dramatic crash in the herring population in prince william sound and those are the things that we're worried about. This, is there something unknown out there? Now, I don't want to be a doomsday and say, but, but, but you, you, any competent scientist is going to be looking for those things. Uh, right now, we haven't seen that. That doesn't mean that it's not surprises out there. But, uh, but right now, the news is generally good. There's still oil in small areas of our coastal ecosystem. But it's extremely small. If you go out there and look for it in areas that were impacted, you won't find it. If you know where you're looking, up in like Bay Jimmy area, you can poke around and find it pretty quickly. But if you just go out there and say, oh, here's some marsh, let me poke around and see if I can find oil, you know, vast majority of the coastline, is it, the oil is difficult to find and not having a significant impact, except in some very small areas. So when we talk, when scientists talk about impacted areas, please keep in perspective, we're not talking about the entire coast. We're talking about small areas that were heavily impacted, and those are still going to be eroding away, and they still have oil in them. But this doesn't mean the whole coast is covered with oil, which is, it, it, in 2010, I was worried that that was going to happen. And it didn't happen, fortunately, in 2010. It didn't happen. A lot of the oil degraded before it ever had a chance to come ashore. And uh, it is degrading fairly rapidly as long as it gets on the surface where the uh, aerobic organisms can can turn it into uh, the food supply. Paula, you want? Yeah, I would also um, echo the message that be, because we are not seeing differences in these um, areas that were impacted originally in 2010 and the ones that were not impacted, that that is, um, that is good news. But I would, I would also uh, caution that when we just focus on an event that happened in 2010, we lose sight of all these other chronic stressors that we've heard about today. So this is um, obviously the big story. The oil spill is a big story. But the ongoing stressors to the system, is they're a huge deal. They're, what, what, we, what, we might, what we are seeing is a decline both impacted and, and unimpacted areas by the oil spill, they're both in decline because they're all affected by these long-term stressors. So I'd, I'd like to add that too, to the discussion. Pat Timmons with Environment Hawaii. I was um, noticing that there was the fresh oil that was brought up by Hurricane Isaac. You mentioned that. So it does make me wonder if there is some reservoir out there of oil that can be unearthed or uncovered and brought to shore by storm surges and 
storm events and hurricanes? Uh, the, the reservoirs that we know of right now are these, these burrows down in the ground, right? Oil is, is, uh, floats on water, of course, and even when it's, it's pretty heavily weathered, it, it floats on water until it gets in close to the shoreline and then the wave action starts mixing it down. Uh, and and, and it, 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 th these, this light oil interacts with sediments and shells and so on and so forth, detritus, and becomes heavier. And so it can be buried just offshore, right? Uh, that didn't happen in marsh areas. The oil ended up on the shoreline. And of course, the oil on the shoreline, uh, because it, when, it, when it heated up in the middle of the summer, it, it uh, percolated down and is still trapped in these, these, these little burrows. And, it, and when you go into these heavily impacted areas and dig those cores out, you can see them. In that. So that oil is not degrading very much. So it, in those impacted areas, there's still fairly fresh oil, right? I don't think, and we have not found, uh, any oil significantly offshore in coastal marshes. That is different from what happened on a, on a sandy beach. On a sandy beach, the, you know, you've got a bar in an intertidal zone in the coast, and there was a lot of oil that got caught up in, in detritus and got buried in that intertidal zone in these big mats. And, and by and large, a great deal of the cleanup was focused on trying to find those mats and, and digging them up along uh, uh, Fushan and Grand Isle and over in uh, Bon Secure over in Alabama. So you had two different kinds of ecosystems. Coastal marshes are much more productive in terms of being the nursery grounds than, say, a, 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 a beach. You know, a, you, can, you can bring a bulldozer in on a beach and scrape the oil out. And in fact, there's numerous pictures of a, of a back end grader out in the water that's four or five feet deep digging down into the sandy bottom and pulling up the oil, right? You can't do that in a coastal marsh. First of all, if you put the bulldozer in the marsh, it would sink. Now, you know, it's just not enough. And you do way more damage by walking around and stomping on the marsh than you do by just leaving the oil there and letting Mother Nature. So a coastal beach, you can use intrusive methods to clean the oil off. Can't do that in, on a marsh. You literally have to stand back, try to flood it, scrape it off. Uh, there were efforts to get in there and cut the grass uh, by, by hand, but you can't use heavy mechanical equipment, so it's difficult. So bottom line is there's, there's, there's very little evidence of significant oil left in the, in the water environment, particularly in the coastal environment. There's some oil around the well site, significant oil parts per thousand. Uh, in general, along the bottom, it's down in the part per million. You know, the, that data, I, I ran through it really quickly. But if you look at all of the NERDA data, they're finding pretty low levels of detectable oil now. Lots of biomass from the oil, right? That's different. That's the oil was came out of the ground, and the bacteria degraded it, and they flocked together as a so-called snow, marine snow. And so, in there are areas down there where you've got this mucousy material on the bottom. That's not oil. That used to be oil, but it has been degraded into a biological material that'll turn into uh, the source of food for for the organisms that are down there. So I don't think I think they're they're the next high, high tide mark. If we have a tropical storm this year, we're going to redistribute some of that oil again. And hopefully, that might be the mechanism for getting it out of those bloody, bloody crab burrows right now. I mean, you can't, you can't dig them all up because there's just too many, and you do more damage to the coast than digging them up. So, we can we can hope that Mother Nature will help us by uh, a not a strong tropical system, a weak tropical system that'll bring some coastal flooding in. That'll bring the oil up. It mixes it up, uh, it allows the bacteria to degrade it. You'll have an, a, a, an impact to the ants and the other organisms, but it's generally going to be a short term as opposed to a long term. At least that's my, my opinion. The ants can survive 30 hours of storm surge. So. Okay. It, Do well, we I, can, I, I can, my observations can kind of echo what Ed was saying. So that photo I showed you where you saw the bear ground. I, I didn't want to get too far into it, but so that was covered um, in 2011. That was covered with some weathered oil. Um, so the, ed the edge there w w had um, some compounds on it that Ed refers to as asphaltines and paraffins. So those are those really long chain hydrocarbons. And so the edge of the marsh looked like it was paved. Well, underneath that was largely unweathered 
oil. Um, so it looked a lot like those pictures you saw of the more brown moose. Um, and so if you, what would happen is when the sun would shine on that black, um, you know, interconnected long chain hydrocarbons is it would crack and that the moose underneath would expand and ooze up, but it would liquefy. And so also that's a mechanism for it to go down into those crab burrows as he was describing. But so you can imagine that would be available as a, with a, with a storm like Hurricane Isaac. I really don't see near the volume of that, you know, in, in going out and doing the sampling. I mean, there's very, very little of that and the amount that's there. I mean, we do see a little bit of those asphaltines and then a really, really small amount of that unweathered oil, but the amount of unweathered oil beneath that crust is so much less than what it was that Isaac really mobilized a lot of that oil and made it available for degradation. Um, so, like, you know, it's, it's what's buried is, um, so it's either buried or it's been, you know, as we know that a lot of these winter storms and other smaller storms are bringing in sediment and it's covered. A lot of the oil is probably just covered and maybe it'll stay there. Um, so if somebody were to do a down core sample, they might find some of these, what were you calling them, pockets of oil? So in um, small areas, in right? small areas, but it's not really, it's not nothing like what it was. Um, it's hard for me to paint a picture for you. I mean, it was so widespread and it's just the, the pockets and the areas where we see visible oil is so much, so much less than what it was. Um, it's, it's remarkable. Okay. Do we have any more questions from reporters in the room? Any questions from the chat? Okay, this will conclude our press conference. Thank you very much.